In this one, I will be discussing fake native groups, such as the Asmin, which fall under the umbrella of the Alliance of Indigenous Nations. I'll be discussing the Assembly of First Nations, and as well, two Canadian government departments, Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, as well as Indigenous Services Canada, and I'll be going over something called the Thunderbird Nationalist Party, and showing the common threads between these things, as well as discussing the biodigital convergence. So, Asmin, or the Anishinaabek Salutrian Metis Indigenous Nation, is one of the oldest unconquered, unsurrendered, untreated matriarchal indigenous nations of North America or Turtle Island. Yeah, if you say so. So, back in 2021, I participated in a couple of freedom rallies and a trusted friend of mine at the time recommended the Asmin card as I was interested in learning about the culture of native people and I found out that this was a pretend Indian tribe so I no longer have anything to do with them. And here they have something called uh, the Tumult Trust Fund if you will. It stands for the Mother Lode Trust, a private association of good steward. Land, so land depositors who share an equal portion of the general asset pool consisting of the natural resources of Turtle Island plus the collective intellectual and physical property of its depositors and stakeholders. This is how we all develop our greatest resource, the creative power of the individual men and women of Turtle Island, the yeah, okay. And so it says that Tumult operates pursuant to indigenous laws, customs, and traditions as protected BT per undrip, adrip, including arbitration. Yeah, okay, whatever you say. So, a couple of things here, and it's that undrip, United Nations Declarations for Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it doesn't define what the word indigenous means in the particular act and it also allots all these land and resource rights to quote unquote indigenous people. So what does that really mean? Well, whatever it is the United Nations deems is indigenous or not. So I personally don't use that term unless I'm referring to corporate documents or reading something in front of me. So. This uh, T-Coin, if you will, part of the Tumult Trust Fund, has to do with the blockchain. That's what it runs on. So, And the blockchain is like a ledger system that has to do with the biodigital convergence in and of itself. Because in order to actually maintain a like social credit score and being able to keep track of everything, you would have to use the blockchain for that. And I will elaborate on that as time goes on. And also, I'll always leave links in the description, so for anything that I may refer to where people may not get the reference, the links will be right there in the description for you. So, the social or economic ecosystem and private members network platform is called Love, L-O-V-E, where members can privately connect and share information they want with each other and or in special groups, and which all platform members can transact in any currency privately and securely. So this is of course a network running on the, the blockchain in and of itself and even though they want to create a new network which I'll be going, I'll be moving into talking about shortly, the point is that you can't really have a sense of privacy when people that work for the United Nations or the Knights of Malta and other things like that which is where everything underneath the Alliance of Indigenous Nations is affiliated with, among other fake native nations, if you will. You can't really have a sense of privacy when talking about those kinds of organizations, right? So, here is the Love Phone, if you will. It's a revolutionary telecommunication provider that boasts worldwide satellite network coverage and encrypted smartphones, which connect people over a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized internet. I would say totally centralized internet. And of course, a blockchain satellite is how everything is connected, as they say here. So, in a nutshell here, this is really just a way to keep track of people's movements and activities. And the blockchain in and of itself 
is a ledger system that will be used for a social credit system. And once again, I will elaborate on that further. This love phone is distributed by ENS International, which is based out in North Carolina. So in this video, uh, Unity from the Stars or whatever, you have this, it says it's an innovative, excuse me, an innovative community emerges connecting users in the digital economy with enhanced blockchain privacy and security featuring the love operating system ecosystem and satellite phones. So you have this guy Chief Engine here of the Okanagan Indian Confederacy. This is another one of the fake native nations underneath the Alliance of Indigenous Nations. Chief Technology Officer for Godspeed Technology Designer and Programmer of the Love OS. And then you have Steve Fentel over here, which is the Director of Godspeed Technologies, Global Peace Ambassador for the World Institute for Peace and Designer of Sustainable Systems that Leverage the Information Age. Yeah, if you say so. And any time the word sustainability is pretty much used within corporate documents or through technocrats like these individuals, they are referring to following the sustainable development goals, which are kind of like uh, the United Nations mandates that these people follow and the standardization organizations, which build the smart technologies and work around the blockchain and that sort of a thing also follow the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as for their mandates. So this guy here, Chief Engine, or whatever he calls himself, says they're trying to create a new network or internet, and he says that the project was launched in 2020, but has been a nine-year project, and Love is a wallet where there are rewards for activity. Well, so... And he also says, we began as a voice wanting to be heard by those in power who continuously disregarded us as frivolous and as meaningless to the greater whole. It became clear to us that it was our time to reach out to other indigenous nations internationally, these are the fake ones, who also cried out to be heard and freed from all the injustices, mistreatment, and control. So, all in all here, what this is kind of... What this is all a part of the blockchain is it's essential to something called the next digital economy or task based economy or token based economy. It goes by several names. So, what they want to do is they want to have your own personal wallet on the blockchain, and this personal wallet will be through the form of an NFT. On the blockchain, there are many things you can do using Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then NFTs, which are non fungible tokens. They're like pictures that hold data, basically. And so combined with CRISPR technology, CRISPR's DNA altering technology, they use a CRISPR DNA strand as the wallet. And basically what happens in this task-based economy is uh, technocrats want to change the working world where instead of long-term jobs with benefits and that sort of a thing, you have temporary task based jobs and there are limited ones available and people are competing for these tasks and those who are able to obtain and complete a task get rewarded tokens onto their CRISPR blockchain NFT DNA strand wallet whatever and then they use those tokens for shelter food water etc and also, just in the bigger picture, too, they would like to streamline voting and also the economy as well into one kind of system, if you will. So this would actually make the blockchain the platform for a social credit system in and of itself. So... This is part of the uh, Alliance of Indigenous Nations on their website. It says, according to the Anishinaabe prophecy and prophecies from around the world, they are told that there would be a time when the new people of all races will emerge. It would consist of human beings of different colors and traditions that will come together on a basis of respect, honor, 
one voice and one heart of freedom are we the new people as indicated in the prophecy yeah that sounds like a whole lot of twisting of anishinaabe beliefs in order to suit your narrative it goes to the alliance of indigenous nations and besides the asmin you have things like the peoples of the salmon the republic of canada run through kevin and net and then you also have um you also have the knights of malta as one of those indigenous nations actually once again Links will be in the description so people can see those videos to actually see those references in front of them. And here is uh, a paper, an essay called Transhuman Crypto Cloud Minds, written by Melanie Swan here of the Blockchain Institute. So, considering the mutual benefits of blockchain and transhumanism, this essay proposes crypto cloud mind is a safe mechanism by which the human mind might transcend its unitary limitations by permissioning partial resources to join a multi-party mind comprised of human and a machine minds in a cloud-based environment cloud minds could have diverse purposes including problem solving addressing future work issues with Maslow smart contracts learning experience exploration innovation artistic expression and other personal development activities. Crypto cloud mines could be multi-currency operating with payment remuneration, security, and especially ideas as the denominations of measure. For thriving in the future, mind node peers could enter yes and payment channels with one another for collaborative idea development. For surviving in the future, good player behavior could be game theoretically enforced with the simultaneous privacy, transparency, property of blockchains, together with the immutable peer confirmed consensus algorithm and audit log checks and balances system. Overall, blockchains might serve as an institutional technology that is the basis for treaties and progress in a multi species society of human algorithm and machine guiding the way to positive transhuman futures yeah if you say so says they understands transhumanism to be the idea that the human race can evolve beyond its current physical and mental limitations especially by means of science and technology Kurzweil's view is that the transhuman future will be a convergence of artificial intelligence which is machines and intelligence augmentation which is humans this is also his answer to the friendly AI question, namely that unfriendly AI will not quote unquote take over the world or make paper clips and strawberry fields because humans and AI will become the same thing. Reformulating Kurzweil's convergence argument, at least the immediate future, is more likely to be one of a multi species society with various permutations of human, algorithm, and machine. Blockchain is also known as distributed ledger technology is an immutable cryptographic cryptography based distributed peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network consensus driven ledger. So yeah, with a ledger system, it's like when you scan groceries at the grocery store, the computer logs everything that's scanned. So the blockchain keeps track of all activity. And so that's why it makes for the basis of that's why it's adequate for the basis of a social credit system and then also the term transhumanism here um they kind of market it as or at least technocrats and stuff like that market transhumanism to be something that is going to improve humanity beyond their supposed limitations but the reality is i prefer to use the term biodigital convergence because Really, transhumanism encompasses the idea of blurring the lines between what is digital and what is biological. So, there's nothing superior about humanity when amalgamating with anything digital. All you're doing is blurring what humanity really is and taking people away from spirit is what you're essentially doing. So... It's actually quite sick. So smart communities report of the National Selection Committee. So this came out around the time that Jean Chrétien, 
Bilderberg member was Prime Minister of Canada. So this document came out in 1999 or 1998. So basically this is, when it says minister's message here, they're talking about the former Minister of Industry, John Manley. Ministry of Industry has since been renamed to ISED, Innovation, Science and Economic Development. I'm very pleased to receive the recommendations for the 12 communities demonstration projects to be funded by Industry Canada. It gives me great pleasure to thank John McDonald, the chair of the National Selection Committee, and its fellow members for the hard work and professionalism involved in making their selections. Smart Communities Program is a key pillar of the Government of Canada's Connecting Canadians initiative. Over the next three years, the 12 smart communities demonstrations projects, one in each province, one in the north, and one in an aboriginal community will help communities become experts in the integration of information and communications technologies into community life. These communities will help position Canada as a leader in the development and use of information and communications technology in the knowledge-based economy of the 21st century. By sharing the development and delivery of strategies, skills, tools, and lessons learned, with other smart communities. This program will also ensure that all Canadians can benefit from these 12 smart communities demonstration projects. I am proud to take this opportunity to thank all communities and their sponsoring organizations who participated in this competition. I encourage them to pursue their ambitions to make smart communities a reality throughout Canada. So yeah, the idea of creating smart communities is a part of this bio-digital convergence, if you will. So, of course, they want to make things more automated and appear to be more uh, convenient, really. And But the reality is that there is significantly less privacy. And as well, it makes things difficult to actually get anything done because of the consistent monitoring. And also, when you factor in a, a kind of social credit system into this in and of itself it also makes it difficult to even try find tasks in and of itself so this is a dystopia that I do not want. In September 1999 the Minister of Industry challenged the community national Smart Communities National Selection Committee to recommend to him 12 nat demonstration projects to be funded through the Smart Communities program so these are the people that are part of the National Selection Committee on here. And then as well on page 8 here I'm going to be, well I'll eventually be talking about something called the Kakena Network. But it says that in 1998 the Prime Minister announced the creation of a blue ribbon panel on smart communities. The panel was mandated to provide advice to the Minister of Industry on the need an opportunity to integrate ICTs to better serve citizens of Canadian communities and the panel's report was released in February of 1999 and the 1999 federal budget provided 60 million dollars over three years to fund 12 smart communities demonstration projects one in each province one in the north and one in an aboriginal community and in June of 1999 the Minister of Industry announced the official launch of the Smart Communities Program, which is a three-year federal program created to help Canada become world leader in the development and use of ICTs for economic, social, and cultural development. And smart Communities is one of the six pillars of the Government of Canada's National Connecting Canadians Initiative, which aims to make Canada the most connected nation in the world. So, of course, Basically, this whole article is about creating these smart communities in and of itself. And it says that smart communities will act as learning laboratories, as they say here. So, going to move forward a little bit. Um, it says that this is uh, basically chaired by someone named John McDonald. And he was appointed by the Minister of Industry to recommend the 12 smart communities demonstration projects to be funded. But by January 14th of 2000, all 46 business plans were received by the Smart Communities Directorate. 
and the business plans were then assessed and evaluated and the National Selection Committee reviewed the business plans and external reviewers consensus reports and met in March 2000 for the final deliberations and then the selected demonstration projects will each enter into a contribution agreement with Industry Canada as it says here so in the timeline January 8, 1998 Prime Minister Jean Chrétien announced the creation of the Blue Ribbon Panel on smart communities and February 1st of 1999 the panel released its report which includes 27 recommendations for a national smart communities program and February 16th of 1999 the federal budget provided 60 million dollars over three years to fund 12 smart communities projects one in each province one north one in aboriginal community June 5, 1999, John Manley, Minister of Industry, announced the opening of the competition to become one of the 12 demonstration projects. The deadline for the letters of intent was in August of 1999, and in uh, October 28th to 30th, 1999, the National Selection Committee meets to review letters of intent and invites selected applicants to submit full business plans in January of 2000. The deadline for submission of business plans and by March 23rd to 25th the National Selection Committee meets to review business plans and makes final recommendation for funding of 12 demonstration projects and of course these are the demonstration projects here we're going to be looking at the Kokaina network of smart first nations uh, in future videos I can look into some of these others but for now we're just going to focus on the Kakena network and the communities include these five first nations over here and of course these five in northwestern Ontario will harness ICTs to improve local access to health education and information services and to establish new links with Canada and the world and this is all part of building the smart community if you will and of course they market this as breaking through social and economic barriers and that sort of a thing and I I'm not sure about these particular First Nations communities but a lot of them don't even have running water so what happens is the formula problem reaction solution you have a problem and then people react to it and then the artificial solution is provided and this is the way that these technocrats and dark forces overall tend to work so that's how that goes I'm just going to be scrolling down a little bit here just past everything so the overall process here is like there were there was a competition these 12 communities ended up receiving funding in order to create smart infrastructure and that sort of a thing so and of course there are many people mentioned here in this so I'll just talk about the chair very briefly he was president and CEO of Leech Technologies CEO of Bell Canada and I uh, was CEO of the New Brunswick of the New Brunswick Telephone Company and board of directors in Teledirect. So of course telecommunications is all part of this biodigital convergence agenda and parts of many other tech related organizations and the bios of all of the other individuals are listed within between pages 36 to 43 or 44 so I'm going to move forward and just talk about the Kakena network it says that they have built as the six first nations are connected by water in the summer and ice in the winter they built an electronic road to Canada and the world and they're using this resource to simulate and manage change in communities 
So the water, the grass, the trees are looked at as relatives, not resources in the native perspective. So this in and of itself is like really just not even true to the culture in and of itself as they're referring to resources here. The broadband network is both a strategy and an outcome. Smart services are being deployed to overcome barriers of distance and isolation to improve community well-being, enhance learning opportunities, and support skills and acquisition. Try actually, it's more like about blurring the lines of humanity by distorting what is biological and what is digital. And we'll be looking at something called Indigenous Perspectives on Biodigital Convergence later in this video. And so, of course, now to move forward, I'm going to be talking about the partners that the Kakena Network has. You have the Assembly of First Nations Chiefs of Ontario, and then you have different tech-related things such as smart communities and other First Nations and telecommunications departments and Canadian government departments. So Indian and Northern Affairs Canada has now actually changed to be two different departments, if you will, which is Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada as well as Indigenous Services Canada. Those are what make up what Indian and Northern Affairs used to be. And then, of course, you have FedNor over here, which is right over here. These There are seven regional development agencies in the Corporation of Canada, which all work on different green projects, smart infrastructure, and play their own corresponding roles with the biodigital convergence. So, there you have it. And so, this is FedNor in and of itself. You have... Patty Hadju, who's Minister of Indigenous Services and uh, and as well Minister of FedNor, of course. And then the President of FedNor is Valerie Gideon. We'll take a look at her first. So she is Micmac Nation, and it says she's a proud mother of two girls. But if you are building smart communities, do you really care about children, let alone your own? She is president of FedNor and the deputy minister of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs and she has a background working in communications and as well in different aspects of health if you will such as First Nations and Inuit Health Branch as the senior assistant deputy minister she was the Associate Deputy Minister of Indigenous Services Canada. And as well, she has worked in regional operations of Health Canada and Regional Director for First Nations and Inuit Health, Ontario Region, Health Canada, and so on and so forth. And as well, she's a founding member of the Canadian Society of telehealth and former board member of the, of the National Capital Region of YMCA. So that is her background. And then of course you have Patty Hadju over here, which is part of the World Economic Forum. Not surprising. She was a member of parliament for Thunder Bay, Superior North in 2015. She is a strong advocate for women's rights, youth empowerment, and affordable housing. What a joke. And before entering politics, she was executive director of Shelter House Thunder Bay and co-author of Thunder Bay Drug Strategy. She also previously worked in public health and focused on drug policy, youth development, and homelessness. She is a compassionate advocate for Thunder Bay, Superior North, and all of Canada, believing that a more inclusive country benefits everyone. And these people that work for the UN and UN-affiliated organizations, corporate think tanks, use words like inclusivity to actually represent excluding those that don't fit their narrative. Just like sustainability really means destruction when you actually break it down. So... That's Patty Hadju for you. And now to look at Crown Indigenous Northern Affairs. 
It continues to renew nation to nation, Inuit to crown, government to government, relationship between Canada and First Nations, Inuit and Métis, modernized government of Canada structures to enable indigenous peoples to build capacity and support their vision of self-determination and lead the government of Canada's work in the north. So the common thread here, and which we'll also be noticing with different organizations, is actually support for UNDRIP, the United Nations Declarations for Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which of course uses the word indigenous and allots all these land and resource rights to quote unquote indigenous people, but does not define what indigenous means in the act. So this guy, this Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations here, Gary, he was a member of parliament in Scarborough, which is part of Toronto, previously served as parliamentary secretary to Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, as parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations and parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism, and human rights lawyer and community activist, as said here. He was a board member of the Youth Challenge Fund, member of Toronto Police Chiefs Advisory Board, and a member of the United Way Newcomers Grant Program. He served as chair of the Canadian Tamil Youth Development Centre and president of the Canadian Tamils Chamber of Commerce and Council of Canadian Tamil Congress. And he managed his own law firm in Scarborough, and he regularly represented lawyers rights watch canada at the united nations so there you have it and there are his many rewards which are notably distasteful so then of course you have dan vandal over here and dan vandal is Minister of Northern Affairs, Minister Responsible for Prairies Economic Development Canada, and Minister Responsible for the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency. So Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency, CANNOR, is Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and Yukon over here. And then, of course, it was, I think, Prairies Can in and of itself. Yeah, Prairies Economic Development Canada, which, of course is Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta. So that's where he deals with green projects and smart infrastructure and that sort of a thing. That's his territory. So it's interesting to note that with Crown Indigenous Northern Affairs, the ministers responsible are also in charge of certain regional economic development agencies just like Patty Hadju of Indigenous Services Canada uh, represents FedNorth. So they're all involved in the smart agenda and biodigital convergence in and of itself. So this guy first became Minister of Northern Affairs in 2019, and he also served five terms as Winnipeg City Councilor, and he served as Deputy Mayor, and he developed Winnipeg's Aboriginal Youth Strategy, and as well, he's a social worker at, uh, at this particular Winnipeg Centre, and it's a... Native Family Resource Center, and of course he is—he was chair of the board of directors for the Aboriginal People's Television Network. So, and as well, he led the board through the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission's license renewal process. So, telecommunications is also integral to the biodigital convergence in and of itself. So this organization, Plenty Canada, I have mentioned in prior videos, they actually partner with Canadian branch of UNESCO. And it, I spoke about this in a video where I talked about the Friendship Centers and their links to the World Economic Forum. And I talked about someone named Carl Dockstader, who is a member of Plenty Canada. 
So it says it's an indigenous led registered nonprofit charitable organization founded in 1976 that works to unite indigenous and western knowledge systems through the frameworks of ethical space and two eyed seeing using both knowledge systems to solve problems for the benefit of all. Headquarters is based on Algonquin territory near Lanark in eastern Ontario where they're developing the Plenty Canada Camp Us or Campus a land-based learning center from which we will continue providing next generation with opportunities to engage in cross-cultural programming. So, of course, here it mentions that some of the projects include sustainable development in South Africa, collaborations with indigenous cultural revitalization in Cuba and Guatemala, the Niagara Escarpment Biosphere Network, and so on and so forth. So. It's going to read about some of the, just one of the partners here, of course, is QNESCO, which is the Canadian branch of UNESCO that supports the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And, of course, it operates under the authority of the Canada Council for the Arts, if you will. Well, there is nothing artistic about biosphere networks or heritage sites and that kind of a thing while there are differences in the definitions of these things the reality is that the UN would keep track of wildlife minerals and plants and that sort of a thing and so the idea here is it says uh, conserve biodiversity and foster sustainable use of natural resources, if you will. So sustainable use of natural resources. So they're deciding what is sustainable and what is allotted or not allotted. Mitigate climate and environmental changes and their impact. Facilitate sustainable development research and education, etc., etc. So... The whole point about this uh, climate change nonsense, if you will, which is largely propagated by Plenty Canada and other organizations, is that the types of things that are actually sprayed into the air are actually graphene nanobiosensors, which end up in the soil, on trees, and in even on our persons and bodies so when it's on our persons and bodies we have the term internet of bodies and then the term internet of x things that's used here in this is really just an excuse to twin the entire environment into a metaverse environment if you will and they claim it helps in monitoring climate change here in order to do this but all they're doing with this metaverse environment, if you will, with these graphene nanobiosensors, it's all part of the smart infrastructure, if you will. And smart infrastructure is the gateway toward that metaverse environment. And these technocrats and dark individuals would like a world where the biologic biological and digital realm is completely blurred and they try to redefine what humanity really is such as using terms like transhumanism so and this particular article which i suggest people give a read is actually on the ieee website if you will the acronym ieee i can't remember offhand but just like the iec and the SCC and ITU, those are all different standardization organizations that use these technologies, develop them, and regulate their use for creating that kind of dystopian environment, if you will. So Larry McDermott is the executive director of Plenty Canada. He is Algonquin and he is as well uh he is a member of many organizations including the international indigenous forum for biodiversity ontario biodiversity council the ontario professional foresters association the healing place partnership and the niagara escarpment biosphere network and serves as co-chair of the lanark county safety and well-being plan 
a former three-time mayor and longtime council member of Lanark Highlands, was the first chair of the Rural Forum of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, was a commissioner for the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and was on the Ontario Species at Risk Public Advisory Committee and Provincial and National Recovery Teams for the American Eel. Larry has also served as a comprehensive claim for claim representative for this particular First Nation, is a certified tree marker and butternut assessor, and holds other environmental certifications. He's also received an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Guelph. He's a humble student for many years of the late Algonquin elder, grandfather William Commanda, who created the Circle of All Nations organization. Larry lives in a 170-year-old log home on 500 acres of biologically diverse Algonquin land along the Mississippi River with his wife, Nancy. Okay, so there you have it in and of itself. And then, of course, just going to move on very briefly to the Assembly of First Nations. We will get to speaking about them a little bit, but this link here is just to show you that as well. They are supporting... UNDRIP in and of itself, the United Nations Declarations for Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I already explained that. So, and then here you have something called the Circular Economy as described by the ISO, which is the International Standardization Organization. And so the Circular Economy in and of itself it mentions ISO 59004, the linear model of the global economy. So what happens is it's a part of the ISO 59000 family of standards specifically designed to foster a shift toward a circular a economy. This standard provides comprehensive guidance applicable to any type of organization. It includes defining key terms and concepts, outlining a vision for a circular economy, elucidating core principles, and offering practical guidance for actionable steps towards sustainability. The standard aims to support organizations in contributing to the UN Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development by facilitating a transition to a circular use of resources. So the key thing to take in here is circular use of resources and of course they're going to use climate change as their excuse for this as well. So the whole idea of the circular economy is just about re or reusing resources as much as possible. So when you think about even the unclean water that's given out that might have E. coli or fluoride or even is pretty well filtered toilet water, it's all just being reduced, reused, recycled, if you will. So the the point about this circular economy, if you will, is that through the waste actually there is, through the waste, they use, through the waste, they make graphene is what they do. And graphene is an integral part, graphene is an integral part of the biodigital convergence and use in nanotechnologies in and of itself. So this video here, they make flash, they call it flash graphene, if you will, because they make graphene from trash in less than one second, if you will. So scientists at Rice University developed a technique that can turn nearly any material into valuable graphene in a matter of milliseconds. And like I mentioned, graphene nanosensors are used for twinning the environment into a metaverse environment, and that's where the lines between what is biological and digital are blurred. So just a little quote from this video. So that it forms from the most thermodynamically stable form of carbon, which is graphene, 
sheets of graphene. The whole process takes just about 10 milliseconds. That's why, that's why Tor calls it flash graphene. So yeah, this is all part of the circular economy to create those graphene nano sensors, if you will, or biochar and other things. So this is another competition about smart cities from 2018 in Canada, unlike the one from the late 90s that I showed. So Halifax, June 1st, 2018, by encouraging innovation in the use of data and connected technology, Government of Canada is empowering communities to become more livable and inclusive while creating economic opportunities for Canadians. Today, the Honorable M. Amarjeet Sohi, the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, announced the 20 finalists of the Smart Cities Challenge, a new competition-based approach that encourages communities to come up with innovative solutions to their most pressing issues. And these are the various prizes. So Bridgewater, Nova Scotia got $5 million prize. This particular First Nation in Ontario, $5 million. Cree Nation of East of East Maine in Quebec, $5 million. Mohawk Council, uh, this Mohawk Council in Quebec, $5 million. And so you can see different First Nations got between five, ten, and sometimes even $50 million. And then different provinces as well were rewarded this as part of their Smart Cities Challenge or whatever. So the finalist if you will let me just move forward here so the finalist uh it says we are proud to be one of the communities selected in the smart cities challenge noted mohawk council of aquasasne the Grand Chief, Grand Chief Abram Benedict said, We will, we have and will continue to engage with our community and as a result are confident that our challenge statement represents an innovative solution to address community priorities. So, and then, of course, some of the new technologies that are implemented here, it says, electric vehicles, food delivery services, smart greenhouses, so that plays in a smart farming in and of itself, health and diabetes education in modernized methods, improved access to health services and physical fitness, and it says holistic and culturally based approaches. I will link my previous video in here to talk about nutraceuticals and an integrated web mobile system that will improve access to health information and track progress. So now to show a little bit about the assembly of First Nations chiefs, if you will, just going to read a little bit about some of these regional chiefs here. So this guy, Ghislaine Picard here, so, Assembly of First Nations, Quebec, Labrador, he is in you from the community of Pessimit, and between 1976 and 89, he dedicated most of his time in communications, he's responsible for communications and media, relations for CAM, and he published a periodical and intended for the Atacamequi, and Inu communities. That's who this was intended for, and I apologize for the pronunciation. And in the beginning of the 80s, Mr. Picard was president of the Quebec Native Friendship Center. So I've already talked about this in, pri in a prior video, but the Jocelyn Formsma is the head of the National Association of Friendship Centers, and she is part of the World Economic Forum. So that's where the whole den of the friendship centers actually carries its links toward the world economic forum and he's one of the founding members of socam which produces radio shows in aboriginal language he participated in unesco international was vice president of cam regional chief of the assembly of first nations quebec labrador in 1992 and has been uh, the regional chief since 
and he sits on the assembly of First Nations executive and management committees and is a spokesperson of comprehensive claims. And so he's also received the National Order of Quebec as one of his rewards. And here we have Joanna Bernard from New Brunswick here. And it says, prominent leader, advancing prosperity and economic development for First Nations in Canada, was born in Boston, Massachusetts, USA, and raised in Madawaska First Nation, New Brunswick. Interim National Chief Bernard is of Italian and First Nations descent. And, of course, has played an integral part in this particular First Nations community. And has also been part of their economic development corporation. And established the Grey Rock Power Center and as well has been part of the committee on like the First Nations Chiefs Committee on Economic Development and the Union of New Brunswick Indians Aboriginal Natural Resources Committee. Once again calling these things resources is kind of interesting coming from a native person. And also um as well co-chair of the Assembly of First Nations Chiefs in New Brunswick and of course sustainable resource management so you have the UN terminology right there and has been a part of the Canadian Armed Forces and received Queen Elizabeth II's Diamond Jubilee Medal aren't you proud of yourself and so on and so forth so those are just some of the regional chiefs as examples. And then, of course, you have the national chief here, which is Cindy Woodhouse Nepenak. She was born in this particular First Nation in Manitoba. And her ancestor, Chief Richard Woodhouse, was an original signatory of Treaty Number no. 2. And she began her term as National Chief of Assembly of First Nations on December 7th, 2023, youngest woman and mother to hold the position. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Winnipeg and completed Harvard Business School's Tribal Leaders Program and Regional Chief. She was elected Regional Chief for the AFN Manitoba Region in 2021, and she led First Nations Child and Family Services and Jordan's principal class action lawsuit, which resulted in over $40 billion compensation for First Nations children and families. And, of course, she has experienced lobbying the Senate, House of Commons, Cabinet Ministers, and the Prime Minister's Office to fulfill mandates from chiefs. She continues to advocate for First Nations priorities, if you will, right for self-determination and all human rights, whatever you say. So, just a little uh, segue here. This particular thing right over here, this particular word is basically... Uh, I can't pronounce it, so I apologize, but this is the title for this indigenous metaverse project from someone named Maya Chakabi, who is a professor at York University who's also native and so this is basically the experience of having a long journey reaching the point of returning home and the the particular word is like this word up here is the Anishinaabe word for cultural resurgence for resisting uh, it is the Anishinaabe word for cultural resistance for resisting colonial violence and for reclaiming our ways of being Anishinaabe through contemporary practices so I don't understand how putting on the meta goggles in and of itself distorting reality is supposed to help you learn and I understand that you're simulating things like the plants and the herbs and that that kind of a thing and the medicines but 
the the reality of the situation is this just actually plays into the bio digital agenda if you will especially if you are using the metaverse to teach students in and of itself so you have in particular i'm just going to read a little bit here you have something called uni virtual which is an innovative virtual platform designed for learning this is a perfect fit for the project it allows students and teachers to collaborate in social networked environments and results in ele elevated levels of retention lowered learning anxiety and due to the nature of metaverse metaverses can virtualize any learning material into fun online activities so Maya Chakabi is an Anishinaabe beaver clan from Thunder Bay and as part of her linguistics curriculum at York University she developed a story to help her students learn the Ojibwe language so this essentially is something also that is linked in with UNESCO. This is a first step in a 10 year project running in tandem with the UNESCO International Decade of Indigenous Languages 2022 to 2032. First chapter will focus on traditional Anishinaabe stories with an aim of saving and igniting new interest in Anishinaabe Moans through digitized gamified learning. The project will rely on funding and support from individuals, businesses, and learning institutions adopting the project early or funding its development. Right, okay. So now I'm going to read about the Thunderbird movement a little bit here. So it says here that at the Thunderbird Nationalist Party of Canada, we stand as the vanguard of Canadian independence and national sovereignty. We believe in a Canada free from external influences where our citizens have the power to shape their own destiny and forge a future that reflects the, the strength and spirit of our nation. The vision is clear to preserve and protect the rich tapestry of Canadian culture and identity rooted in the values that have defined us for generations. We champion the idea that Canada, blessed with abundant natural resources, should be a beacon of prosperity for its people, with the benefits of our land and labor flowing back to those who call these who call this great nation home. Okay? So the Thunderbird Party, if you will, it basically mentions a gold standard in this year and so when it talks about the gold standard I understand that in the 70s Canada went from a gold standard to a credit standard if you will but when people often talk about uh, returning to a gold standard whether you're talking about this Nisara Jasara thing oftentimes people talk about NFTs on the blockchain so does he really mean a gold NFT I don't really know, but you can't trust politicians at face value. And by politicians, I am referring to Adrian, which Adrian Thomas here is the face of the Thunderbird political party. I've also interviewed him myself, and if he's open to it, I'd happily talk to him further about the Thunderbird party if he is open to it. And so he also uh, basically the party seeks to dismantle the uh, dismantle indian affairs and northern affairs act and as well so the thunderbird it says the thunderbird naturalism party but it should say nationalist party so the the thing here too is that it mentions as well a a council of elders that are apparently running this party but that's just a little bit vague and also provides you know more more questions than answers but it says here that our party platform is based on unity spiritual freedom and a deep respect for the environment and its inhabitants our policies are informed by the belief in interconnectedness sustainable development and the inherent inherent value of all living things so yeah you're pretty much playing into the united nations agenda and while adrian is very well spoken and speaks about the united nations and the world economic forum at, at great length 
it really begs the question here why this kind of jargon like sustainable development is used in his platform and as well we'll be talking about his views on undrip as what he says appears to be a little bit different than what is written here actually very different and it says it's led this is led by a council of elders so if adrian isn't the leader then who are these council of elders then that's the good question i'd say so council of elders is responsible for ensuring that the party's platform is aligned with the interests of all canadians and for promoting policies that benefit the country as a whole right if you say so so now moving into this combating un influence part here it says here that the it says here that international organizations including the wef may influence discussions and provide forms for dialogue but they do not control sovereign nations or their governments canadian sovereignty and governance are maintained through its democratic processes and institutions not through external entities like the wef so that's pretty much like saying the wef can provide their input but they're not directly involved by allowing their input you are actually directly involving the, the wef it, and even if so, many politicians in Canada, such as Justin Trudeau, Christia Freeland, uh, Minister of Finance, and then of course Patty Hadju, Minister of Indigenous Services, are part of the, the World Economic Forum, and there are many other politicians in Canada that are as well. So you actually have to remove people from office entirely if you were to get rid of the World Economic Forum's influence, but that doesn't even factor in, so this term sovereignty if you will when you are a subject of a country like the citizen if you will you're not really sovereign in an, you're not really sovereign right um that's not an example of sovereignty in and of itself when you have a sort of sense of overrule and cans and cannot do's so let alone uh, the birth certificate or any of that kind of a thing. I'm not really going to go into talking about the, the maritime stuff, if you will. So, as well, when it mentions, like, UNDRIP and stuff like that, they're talking about re-implementing um, UNDRIP, if you will. And, and the, the point is that while it's heavily criticized in here it's they're really talking about remodeling undrip in and of itself so you're not actually removing the united nations influence in and of itself right when undrip in and of itself is something that shouldn't even really be a discussion in and of itself it just shouldn't even be there in actuality but when it comes down to like the whole problem reaction solution you have reservations that don't have clean water and then the united nations comes out with something to basically say that you have the right to self declaration there are all these land and resource rights to these quote-unquote indigenous people but once again it does not define what indigenous means right so all in all in and of itself undrip is just a piece of trickery and tyranny for really everyone not just first nations people so and then you have the energy action plan here it says energy independence action plan puts canada and its people first cutting red tape promoting innovation ensuring a prosperous sustainable future for the nation's energy sectors with these measures we can build an, an energy independent canada that is economically strong and environmentally responsible so, of course, the term sustainability is used here, so it just seems like he is really supporting sustainable development in and of itself and hasn't really actually combated issues. He's just more like brushing over them and trying to remodel them and give himself a good image. Speaking about Adrian, I mean, but if he's willing to talk about this Council of Elders or I get the chance to interview anyone from this Council of Elders, that would uh, be awesome because then questions could be answered and also 
I don't think that playing into a political system of Canada is really an adequate solution for the people. We need to form ethics committees and remove remove the standardization organizations and their involvement as their involvement is far more entrenched than the United Nations or the World Economic Forum. But we also still have to remove UN and WEF influence from here. And we need to return to our roots and utilize what we have here as quote-unquote Canada's most resource-rich country, especially with all of the water that is present here. So we really don't need to be doing so much importing and exporting and stuff like that as well. So anyway, I'm um, just going to talk a little bit about this guy named James Favell of the Bear Clan Patrol in Winnipeg, in Winnipeg. So Bear Clan Patrol help out homeless people and stuff like that, people suffering from addictions, that sort of a thing. James Favell is their former leader and says he's suing the Winnipeg Community Safety Organization he once led, allegedly uh, damaging his reputation. Former Executive Director of Bear Clan Patrol, Inc. is seeking financial punitive and exemplary damages from the civil suit he filed in Manitoba Court of King's Bench on September 28th. Suit alleges a chairperson of Bear Clan's patrol, Bear Clan's board of directors, Shanine Robinson, Desjardins defamed and disparaged him by publishing a message alleging he was a... <clears throat> I'm not going to say this word because I want to keep this video on YouTube. And, of course, the, the terms used in the comments are listed here. Once again, not repeating those things. And then it says here that the suit does not say where the comments were published. It does say the message was in response to a social media post regarding the plaintiff and his involvement with Bear Clan Patrol. Favell helped resurrect the Bear, Bear Clan Patrol in 2014, which uses volunteers to keep an eye on inner city streets after the unsolved murder of Tina Fontaine, a 15-year-old First Nations girl whose body was discovered in the Red River. So, this little... Uh, article here just shows that <clears throat> he was speaking at a United Nations summit in Abu Dhabi, which is in the United Arab Emirates. So I'm just going to show some images here. So here he is at the United Nations summit in Abu Dhabi. And of course, you see sustainable development goals and all of that. So now just to backtrack a little bit here. So this right here is somebody who goes by the name David Golden Wolf or Hollow Bone or whatever it is he calls himself. But he is a Polish Canadian that does lives where he sings Native American songs and has feathers in his hair and has a bucket for a drum and burns sage for sometimes 90 minutes straight and he likes to tell natives about proper protocol and how they should behave how they should behave walking the red road and how can he teach about protocol and the red road if he isn't walking the walk or if he's not native the lives he does are not valuable content and really are popcorn entertainment at best He's also got a Cowboys and Indians shirt, just like this guy, Jeremy Gibson, over here. Jeremy Gibson, I actually did a live with him, and I've spoke, uh, I did a live with him, and I've spoke about him in prior videos. And this Cowboys and Indians shirt, you can actually purchase on the Thunderbird Nationalist Party's website. So, Cowboys and Indians and Thunderbird Nationalist Party, I'm not... Sure, if they're exactly the same thing or not, but they operate in tandem, bread and butter. So, as well, the Thunderbird Party's goal is to nationalize resources, if you will, which means that the government would actually have control over natural resources. So, this is exactly what was done in World War II by Hitler, and this is exactly what is proposed by the Thunderbird Nationalist Party. So Jeremy Gibson here is a transient 
and is well known for misinformation and distractions with plenty of fear mongering. Like I said, we did a live and I was explaining the biodigital convergence to him. He wasn't prepared and I helped him the best that I could. Uh, this link of the interview will be attached in the links in my video in the description. And he was a Trumper and promoted Pierre Polyev. There are some allegations against him, which I won't be getting into because this isn't the Jerry Springer show. These allegations are discussed by someone named Jen Como, who has a group called the Ironic Unity Project, which you'll want some popcorn for. He says he has a quote-unquote team, but never mentions who he's involved with. He's not providing solutions, and he was also at one point intoxicated and talked about hanging Justin Trudeau. He's been appointed the White Buffalo from the White Buffalo Prophecy of Native Americans by that Polish-Canadian David Golden Wolf, and I'll attach that live as well for some more popcorn and entertainment. So that's how that goes. Now I am going to talk about Suzanne Brandt of the First Nations Technical Institute. So the First Nations Technical Institute, if you will, she this is Suzanne Brandt, Bear Clan and a member of Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty and Tendinaga Mohawk Territory. And She's graduated from York University. She's also a member of Rotary International, member of the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force, and she's a founding board member of CKWE Tendinaga Radio, and as well, past committee member of Remedial Action Plans Bay of Quinty, the Environmental Advisory Committee, the Mohawks of Bay of Quinty, and Health Advisory Committee for the Mohawks. Uh, Bay of Quinty. So, and as well, she has some prominent work through Policy Horizons, actually, and that's where this article called Indigenous Perspectives on Biodigital Convergence comes into play. I've used it in prior videos, but I think it's worth reading once again. The biodigital convergence describes the intersection and, in some cases, merging of biological and digital technologies. Biodigital technologies including these things. Once again, I have to be careful what I say because I want to keep this video on YouTube. Digitally controlled surveillance insects, microorganisms genetically engineered to produce medicinal compounds, and more. While significant scholarship has been paid to the ethical dimensions of biodigital technologies from a Western standpoint, little attention has focused on indigenous views on the biodigital convergence and so this article looks at the biodigital convergence from a Haudenosaunee perspective so uh, the term synthetic biology will see used throughout here it says the article represents our thoughts on the biodigital convergence and synthetic biology more broadly derived from presentations that we gave at Policy Horizons Canada Biodigital Convergence webinar series in November 2020. So, Policy Horizons was created by the Privy Council of Canada and is the face for the biodigital convergence in Canada. So, it says here that the term synthetic biology was first used by Holbum to describe bacteria that has been altered by recombinant DNA technology. Synthetic biology was later reintroduced at the annual meeting of the American Chemical Society in 2000, referring to the use of living systems as host for the synthesis of organic molecules that do not otherwise occur naturally. Offer a broader definition of synth this is where a uh, broader definition of synthetic biology as the use of molecular biology tools and techniques to forward engineer cellular behavior with a set of common engineering approaches and laboratory practices. 
further suggest that a goal of synthetic biology is to modify existing life or to create new synthetic life that is compatible with Darwinian natural selection. So just to give some background here, especially for the non-native people watching this, the Haudenosaunee peoples, formerly called Iroquois people of the Longhouse, are the confederacy of six First Nations, Mohawk, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Seneca, and Tuscarora, united by a common goal to live in harmony. Contemporary Haudenosaunee communities can be found in upstate New York, Quebec, Ontario, Wisconsin, and Oklahoma. So now I'm going to talk about Mama Day's words. Mama Day's words evoke the Haudenosaunee principle of the good mind, which is derived from the great law of peace. The good mind occurs when the people put their minds and emotions in harmony with the flow of the universe. The good mind confers the ability to make a sound judgment for the welfare of broader Haudenosaunee society. Connect good mind to land. To the Haudenosaunee, the good mind and land are inseparable, for neither is possible without the other. Furthermore, this source here rightly assert that where one is everything where one is has everything to do with who one is. What we take from all of this is that the full expression of our humanity is only possible through intimate connection to each other, to territory, and the various natural cycles shaping existence. So if mind and land correlate to each other and one who treats the land with respect is one who has a good mind as said here using terms for the great law of peace then essentially what they're saying here and as they talk about decentralized food production through synthetic biology the ability to create food and engineer meat without the need for arable land what they're really talking about is 3d bioprinting food and anything natural giving it really the illusion of something natural so they're talking about 3d bioprinting to preserve the land if you really think about it so this is really just using the great law of peace to further a technocratic agenda is what it is so Suzanne Brandt should be a name that everybody knows but anyway yeah, the common ground here that I want to say between these organizations and political parties is the biodigital convergence and support for UNDRIP in and of itself, which will allow for the taking of land and resources. So, like I said, we should be forming ethics committees to remove these people such as Suzanne Brandt from their positions and also getting rid of these technocrats and their influence at least within this land which you know people call Canada but anyway I just want to thank everybody for watching and for listening and for taking down this information people can feel free to reach out to me directly on Facebook at Matt Unseated or here on YouTube at Matt the Unseated and Links will be in the description. So thanks everyone for watching. Chi miigwech, niawa goa.